Our next uh, session is called um, Writing in the Family, Meg and Tom Keneally. Well, unfortunately, I'm standing in for Tom Keneally today. Uh, Tom was taken to hospital last night, but he's out today and he's well. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so we're very sad that he's not with us because he's an extraordinary man. And uh, Tom actually published his first novel before Meg was, in fact, born, which was in 1964. And since then, he's published a few more and uh, won a couple of prizes along the way. His novels include, of course, The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, Schindler's List and The People's Train. He won the Miles Franklin Award, the Booker Prize, uh, the Los Angeles Times Prize, the Mondello International Prize and has been uh, made a literary lion of the New York Public Library, a Fellow of the American Academy, recipient of the University of California Gold Medal and is now the subject of a 50 cent Australian stamp. <laughs> a round of applause for Tom Keneally. <laughs> Meg Keneally is the author of two novels, uh, Fled and The Wreck. She started uh, her working life as a junior public affairs officer at the Australian Consulate General in New York before moving to Dublin to work as a sub-editor and freelance feature writer. On returning to Australia, she joined the Daily Telegraph as a general news reporter covering everything from courts to crime to uh, animals' uh, birthday parties at the zoo. We've all done a bit of that. Uh, she then joined Radio 2 UE as a talkback radio producer. For more than 10 years, uh, Meg has worked in corporate affairs for listed financial services companies and doubles as a part-time scuba <coughs> diving instructor. I think that's true, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Meg Keneally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Dad sends his huge apolog apologies that he can't be here. He's home from hospital this morning and he's resting well, but unfortunately he's in no fit state to be here today. He's gutted because he really wanted to be here, so... Um, but uh, we're confident that he'll make a full recovery in time and he has told me to threaten you all with a visit uh, once, he's, once he's well again. So apologies again that it's just me. Um, <laughs> It's funny you mentioned the postage stamps, Graham, because I've got a friend called Adam Courtney, who's the son of Bryce, and we call ourselves the children of the postage stamps. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very privileged, I must yes. say. It's fantastic. <laughs> now, we were, you were, well, I'm, as I say, kind of ringing, so um, I'll fumble my way through this a bit. But uh, we were here to talk about, uh, I'm talking as Tom, of course. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, talk about, I'll talk like Tom. Yeah. Uh, but uh, on the four, uh, to talk about the collaboration between the two mm. of you on the four convict era Montserrat historical murder mysteries, uh, following gentleman convict and amateur sleuth Hugh Montserrat around the colonies of early Australia. And it's been said that the character of Montserrat straddles mythology and reality. He has the knowledge and background of a lettered gentleman, the guile and cunning of a convict, and the adventurous flaw that gives him the verve to tackle a mystery. Sounds pretty good to me. So maybe you just fill us in just a little bit on the on the, the theme of the novels and the, the sort of the plotting, and then I'll get you to read a little bit so we get some sure. idea of the uh, the way that you write and the sound of your voice and of Tom's voice, of course. Sure. Well, um, the story starts in Port Macquarie where we have Hugh, Hugh Llewellyn Montserrat, who's an educated man but not a wealthy one. So he sort of falls between the cracks. He doesn't really belong anywhere. He doesn't belong with the lags and he doesn't belong with the gents. Uh, and he um, is a two-time recidivist convict who's been sent to this colonial era supermax in Port Macquarie, uh, where he ends up solving a murder in which his good friend Hannah Mulrooney, a, 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 a former convict, uh, was implicated. And because of his... Uh, detective skills, he's told, all right, you can have your ticket of leave, but you have to go from penal settlement to penal settlement, solving murders that are too sensitive for the local police, if they even exist in the area. Um, and if you stuff up and can't solve the murders, then you're, uh, you know, you're back in a penal settlement yourself. Um, so he has a bit of a panic because he realises that the real brains behind the operation is Mrs Mulrooney. She's the one who's, who has the great insights and the great perceptions, so he has to contrive a way to bring her with him. So uh, um, there are so far four books uh, in this series, each in a different penal settlement, and we do, uh, we do plan more um, in, in due course. So. I think I read that you're planning 14. 
Well, Dad said 12, and there's <laughs> certainly... I mean, the amazing thing about Australian history is we would have no problem coming up with plots for 12. No. None. None whatsoever. Um, we've already got another four quite detailed ones uh, for when we end up returning to it. Um, but I think 14 might be... I mean, if we could sign a contract for 14, that would be great because then he would be contractually obliged not to drop off the perch, which would be, <laughs> um, which would be you know, very comforting. Uh, so uh, um, not that he's in any danger of that at the moment, I stress. Not mm. well, but we'll recover, so... <laughs> Look, Patrick, well, I think I think that might have been what sent him to hospital in the first what place. What a loss that was. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. yeah, the, the mm. performance against St George was the final straw, mm. I think. Um, we were talking before out there about uh, something that interests me at the moment. I'm just writing a story about a, uh, for the newspaper about the crime show uh, Unforgotten, which some of you may have seen. It's uh, a, a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, UK television series uh, with the great Nicola Walker in it. But it, it, it raises, writing about procedural crime at the moment, or crime of any kind, raises the problem of uh, all the things that have happened, uh, well, to the justice systems in various countries recently, and, of course, the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement and the way that's affected so many countries as well. Uh, so everybody's had to sort of... Crime writers have had to rethink the way that they approach crime to some extent. But you were suggesting out there... you mentioned police before, that uh, it's not such a problem in colonial times because no. there's basically no police and no authority. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no such thing as a police procedural, bec procedural because the procedure was set by whoever happened to be the most powerful person in the district at the time. <laughs> and there was no concept of conflicts of interest. You had people like Samuel Marston, who was a reverend, a landowner, um, a magistrate, and the governor of several important convict era institutions. So if somebody like that said black was white, it was white. Um, which is, and we play on that in the books. We find it really interesting to play on. He's being sent here as a convict who's being sent to actually enforce the law, and the people who are tasked with enforcing the law are actually trying to undermine it. So, you know, we really enjoy mm. playing with that particular theme. Now, I gather all this started around 2014. Uh, when you say that you joined uh, what you call the family business. Yes. Uh, and I found a quote here. Uh, that's when my father tossed me a sheaf of papers across his dining room table. I started writing about a gentleman convict detective who wins his freedom by solving a murder and has to go from one penal station to the next, solving crimes to keep it. Anyway, why don't you have a crack? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's how golf. it started. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And he did chuck me a sheaf of papers and he'd written about 30,000 words of a first draft and said, look, I really want to do this. Um, he said he was reading The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and writing uh, a volume of his um, uh, multi-volume History Australians uh, published by Alan and Amon. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so he was thinking convict detective convict and all of a sudden it, it sort of occurred to him why don't I write about a convict detective and then he realised he didn't have time and it wasn't really quite his wheelhouse so he asked me to have a crack you know and I just sort of gulped and got very scared and said yes and um, it, it didn't pan out the way we, we thought it would in terms of the division of labour and who was doing what in the process but it you know it was wonderful to be involved. There was an inspiration, I gather, which it must have come from Tom, the gentleman convict yeah, James, James Tucker. Tucker. Yeah, James Tucker was uh, a gentleman convict who was sentenced to Port Macquarie as well. Uh, and he was... You could get sent here for anything. He accused a powerful relative of pedophilia um, in England and the relative um, uh, took exception to that and sued him for criminal libel. So he was transported for criminal libel. Um, and, you know, drink got the worst of him once he was out here and he committed various crimes and essentially died destitute and a convict. But we were interested in, um, in looking at how you, how you have the education of the son of a peer, um, but you've got to navigate through this world. Yeah, so... Uh, and Tom himself, I think, I read, comes from a convict background somewhere. And uh, and is your mother as well? Uh, well, um, Dad has a convict great-uncle. Uh, on my side, I've got a convict great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother. Um, my great-great-grandmother was in the Parramatta Female Factory, so the second book in the Montserrat series is set in the Parramatta Female Factory. Ah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so quite an extraordinary... I've got place. a couple of convicts in my background, mm. but they, they were both sent out to Australia for stealing butcher's steals. They, and the description of them is that they were scrawny little guys who didn't have an idea about anything. <laughs> Literally, quote unquote, from the police report. So that's my background. It's not very, not very glamorous in the convict uh, sense. Uh, now, you mentioned working together. Now, how, how, this is a process I gathered that could have been quite mm. difficult with Tom. I mean, had you been, you hadn't been, I think you said somewhere that uh, I read that uh, his writing had always taken place behind the, the study yep. door. So yes. you've never been involved in this extraordinary writing life? No, no, because it's, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, I was sort of peripherally involved in that, you know, I read uh, manuscripts whenever he'd let me, and then when I was younger, I was looking for drawing paper and I crayoned on the manuscript of the chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, and this was before they had computers, so he basically had to retype it. So I was in a bit of trouble for that. So that was my, you know, I do the occasional um, uh, book review for The Australian, but that was my first attempt at literary criticism, the uh, crayoning of the chant of Jimmy Blacksmith manuscript. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but beyond that, um, it is a very solitary endeavour. So it was a place where he'd lock himself away and it was a country that only he had access to. So, you know, quite apart from anything else, I was really keen to join this harebrained scheme of his um, to get a sense of him, of, of him as, a, as a worker and as an artist as well as, as a dad. Had he ever, crit had he ever critted your um, journalism? Had he read your stories and said, oh, that could be a bit better? Um, you uh, can do he, he hadn't criticised it so much. Um, uh, I'd, I'd given him, uh, I've sort of been scribbling bits of creative writing in, you know, uncountable notebooks since I was about that tall. And I'd occasionally give him stuff to read. And to his, to his great credit, he is a very, very honest reviewer uh, because he, um, his belief is that you're not doing anyone any favours by giving them false praise. Mm. So he's very, very good at um, uh, constructive criticism. So that was, a, you know, and, and since then he's given me um, constructive criticism on some of my solo books as well. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, on the whole, he was um, massively encouraging of anything that we, that we did and at the same time very, very good at giving us guidance where we could do better. So it was actually a really ideal combination, I feel, because you got the sense that you were being encouraged and you got information to help you do better as well. So he tossed these pages across yes. at you, across the table. Mm -hmm. How long did you have to have a bit of a look? Oh, look, I, and how I did you come back at him with it? Um, I think I stammered um, <laughs> and I, I, I said, why me? Um, and he said, because you're a stubborn little bugger and I know if you commit to this, you'll do it. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, so ultimately, I, you know, I thought, this is an extraordinary honour. It's terrifying, it's <laughs> exciting and why wouldn't I sort of jump at the opportunity mm. to sort of follow this particular path and see where it goes. Um, so we did, yeah. And uh, um, initially we thought we were going to write alternating chapters, but our voices are very, very different. Um, uh, so uh, ultimately we ended up plotting the novels together and then I'd write the first couple of drafts and then we'd, we'd rewrite together and I'd be in constant contact with him if I wanted some feedback because I'd say, you know, um, you've got a dog in this fight so you have to let me ring you in and <laughs> pick your brains whenever, when, whenever yeah. you want. Uh, and, you know, through the, through the editing process, when, when we were both sitting at the, doing what we call dueling computers, sitting at his kitchen table, um, and editing, um, uh, I really got to look under the bonnet of what makes a novel. Uh, and he's so extraordinary in being able to suggest seemingly minor changes which add about five different layers of nuance and meaning. And I don't know how he does it. It's not something mere mortals can do. No. <laughs> I think it's... Uh, um, so I just stand back in awe. And, uh, you know, it was a wonderful apprenticeship for me and I'm extraordinarily lucky to have had that opportunity. Talking of awe, though, I, I did read that when you um, started to uh, inject your own voice into the, the 30,000 words you had, yeah. um, which Tom had written, you seized up. Uh, yeah. What gave me the right, I thought, you said, to change the words of a man uh, with dozens of books and a Booker Prize in his back pocket? Mm. How did you get over that little drama? Uh, look, in the end, um, I tried to write around it. Um, so I thought, okay, he's got this, these 30,000 words, I will just sort of 
try to put it in a in a picture frame, so to speak. And that's when we found that actually our styles didn't, you know, were a little bit too different to sort of coexist in the one book. Um, and so in the end we decided to, uh, so, th so there is some of, uh, there's, there's a lot of him in these books because he, you know, helped, you know, he story edited, he, um, uh, gave me a lot of feedback on the manuscripts. There's a lot of, um, quite apart from any words he might have written, there's a lot of his soul in these books in the way that they're constructed in the issues that they deal with and that sort of thing. So, It's easy to sort of not think of Tom as one of the great historians, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I'll he, he, he has is. written a huge amount of history and he has, both in yeah. book form and in, in articles and uh, essays yeah. over the years. Yeah, he has, including, you know, including his multi-volume history uh, called Australians mm. and he's and various other... History books like mm. the uh, the Great Shame and uh, Commonwealth of Thieves and things like that, but it's always been a passion of his, and he just has this extraordinary ability, which I wish I had inherited, mm. to absorb huge amounts of information and process them in a way that brings something new to them. Mm. Um, and I think that's why he's, he's he's been such a success as a non-fiction writer as well as a fiction writer. But the process is, I gather, you you now write the first drafts from scratch. Mm -hmm. Uh, using the characters that Tom's created, yes. uh, write the first few drafts, and then Tom comes in with his, you know, yeah. changes. Then, then we sit down together mm. and sort of talk about, you know, we nut things out like, um, uh, are the characters working? Are we exploiting all the issues here? Is the historical framing accurate enough? And sometimes you do have to take liberties with the truth. My approach is always, both in the Montserrat books and in my solo books, I always have a bit of a confessional at the end saying what I made up and what I didn't. Um, because I've always loved reading that sort of things, those sort of things whenever I write historical, whenever I read historical fiction. I love to know what was true and what, what tell, wasn't. Tell us a little bit about your own books then. Which are the, there's two oh, books. Two, uh, two at the moment, yes. Uh, Fled it was the first one and it's based on the escape of a first fleet convict called Mary Bryant who nicked the governor's cutter and uh, sailed it to West Timor as you do. Uh, there was a TV series, I think, on Mary Bryant, wasn't there? There was. Yeah. There was quite some years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, made by George Adams, who made the Dr. Blake mysteries. Ah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, uh, so there's that one, and then there's uh, my most recent came out late last year, The Wreck, which is uh, about a woman who was caught up in the Peterloo massacre, becomes involved in a failed rebellion, winds up in Australia, and and uh, realizes that perhaps there's more than one way to change a world other than cutting people's heads off as she, as she wants to do. <laughs> now, you're obviously pretty practised now at, at plotting, but I gather the plots came together for these Montserrat books when you were, went walking with Tom. Yes, yeah, we always... Uh, whenever, we're, whenever we're plotting, we walk, and we start off with um, a vague idea of we want to write in this particular penal settlement and the murder victim is X... And that's all we have, and then we sort of put the meat on the bones as we're walking along. Uh, rules of writing together? Have you come up with any set rules that mm. shouldn't be trespassed? Or We haven't come up with any set rules, and, and we actually don't argue, and no-one ever believes me when I say yeah, this. Yeah, no. I know. Everybody, everybody thinks I'm, being, um, I'm demurring, but the fact is we're both way too passive-aggressive to argue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're very temperamentally similar, um, and... Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work with him, and obviously I'm not going to tell my grandmother how to suck eggs, so to speak. Um, uh, and everything he, he, he says has immense value. So I don't really push back on anything if he thinks something's not working. I'm very grateful for the, for the feedback. Um, and we just... Um, uh, although sometimes, occasionally I'll say, you know... OK, but you want to do this, but that conflicts with this part of the story and that's not going to work unless we change this. And, you know, all of the conversations you have with yourself when you're writing a solo mm. novel are conversations we have with each other. Um, and it's terrific. And then we have a glass of wine at the end of the day. Tom likes a glass of wine. He does. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and sadly, it's not possible for him at the moment, but I'm mm. sure he'll have his boots back on before too long with regard I to toured, that. Uh, my wife and I toured with Tom... Uh, to the uh, Tennessee Williams Literary Festival in New Orleans a couple of years ago. And uh, to be anywhere where Tennessee Williams had been mm. was pretty extraordinary for all of us. But for Tom to sit there in the same bar where Tennessee Williams had had a drink, that was it. 
Yes. I'm having absinthe, he'd shout. And yes. Tom's wife would say, no, you're not. <laughs> he, it was just the most fabulous tour. And uh, uh, we had a bizarre... Has he ever told you this story? We had a, the woman that was organising our trip disappeared one afternoon. Oh, no. And we couldn't find her. She just literally had disappeared. And Tom was right on to this. It was a real-life mystery, murder yeah. mystery. Uh, we, we, went, we didn't know what to do. We literally couldn't find her. Anyway, we walked the streets of New Orleans looking for her. This is Australia's most famous novelist and his entourage looking for this tour operator <laughs> who had just literally disappeared off the face of the earth. And there were, this was after, not that long after Katrina. We'd actually gone to a jazz club the night before and gone a back way. Uh, and the man had just come out of nowhere dressed in a white suit shouting at us, get out of here, get out of here, you get murdered here, get out of here. Oh, wow. Well, this is all a bit weird. Oh. Um, but the woman had disappeared and uh, we eventually uh, went into her. My wife's a, a kind of investigative journalist as well, uh, even though she's the travel editor, but you can't stop her. The, but uh, we got ourselves into her room. We got the manager up. Uh, we went through her things. We, had no, we, just, no, we didn't know what to do. Tom was loving all this and said, to ring the police, ring the cops. So we rang the cops, and the first thing, Tom loved this, the first thing the cops said from the New Orleans police was, excuse me, sir, is, is she a drinker? <laughs> um, and so we, we didn't know. Eventually she turned up, and it was just that, that real-life sort of murder yes. and mystery adventure just really tantalised him. And in New Orleans. Um, of all places. Yeah. But it was just an extraordinary event. Yes. Um, that sounds wonderful. Now, I was going to ask before, was that the dialogue. Mm. Who writes the dialogue? Dialogue's always a difficult thing. Um, I, tend to, I tend to write the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, uh, yeah that's, that's generally, generally me. Uh, but obviously, you know, there's a lot of feedback on that while we're in the editing process as well from Dad. But, um, but yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Now, um, film and TV rights. You know, you mentioned um, Mary Bryant before. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, now, uh, that, the, as, well, I'm, I'm working with a producer at the moment to, to try to get these, get these made and we're having some, um, uh, some promising talks with promising people. They were optioned and um, uh, now we've decided to try to, you know, try to rev it up again. It was called um, the Dr. Blake Mysteries, people were interested. That was in the yes, press. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's someone involved in this who was involved in Dr. Blake as well. Um, so we're at the moment we're having conversations which I hope will bear fruit relatively soon. I've written the pilot for the first oh, wow. um, the first season. So uh, if that first season ever becomes a reality, I will shout it from the rooftops. No, we will we'll all be <laughs> shouting it from the rooftops. Now what about reading a bit for us now? Okay. It's, it's interesting to get a sense of the, the style. And I'm now at the age where I need these. Uh, uh, so this is the fourth and latest book in the series. Not the last, but the latest. Um, uh, and it's called The Ink Stain. And one of the things that we look at in this particular novel is how we nearly lost a free press in colonial Sydney. And it starts, not surprisingly, with the murder of a journalist in 1826. So I'll read you the murder, which ultimately gets Montserrat and Mulrooney sent to Sydney to investigate. Sydney Jail, March 1826. What's it for this time, Mr Horwood? Trespassing again. As the Chief Warden of Sydney's George Street Jail, it was a question Frank Gleeson rarely needed to ask. He did, not, he did not get many return visitors. No, Frank, trespassing was last time. At the church, remember? We're back to criminal libel now. The prison stones gave Horwood's deep voice a rumbling, ominous sound. The place had better acoustics than St Paul's Cathedral. Frank should know he'd heard enough moans bounce off the walls in his time as a warden. He found it interesting that here, where the primary walls of the vast colonial penal system were made of water and wilderness, the stones still reproduced some of the echo, bulk and menace of a prison in the British counties. Horwood, though, was an unusual prisoner. He was not a moaner. He was too busy writing. He was also one of Frank's more frequent guests. Frank was not about providing some additional comforts in exchange for a fee. He considered himself a practical warden. To those who robbed in dead of night or forced themselves on women or stabbed rusty daggers into their friends, he gave nuggety bread and brackish water and the occasional kick in the ribs. But to those who had done more than, more, no more than stab a piece of paper with a pen, well, no harm in being lenient, especially when they could pay. They all, though, paid more than Horwood. 
Not that he knew it, Frank wanted to keep Horwood writing, so he charged him just enough to cover expenses and let the man believe he was being genially swindled. At this remove from the British Parliament, the governor had the power of the king. There was no voting here even for landowners, no boroughs, not even rotten ones. The only voice people like Frank had came out of the mouths of people like Hallward. Two shillings then, said Frank. Hallward looked up from the desk, which was covered in neat stacks of paper. Probably the finest item ever seen in this cell, the desk stood like a fantastical island in the middle of the grey ooze, the bare splintered boards and the high barred and grimed windows. During Horwood's first few interactions, he had paid handsomely to rent a desk and Frank had procured him a new one each time. Now Frank just kept this one in a storeroom, knowing it would be needed again before long. Price has gone up, said Horwood. Risk has gone up. And the cost of bread. You know this yourself, champion of the common man that you are. Hallward chuckled, shaking his head. I cannot fault your enterprising nature, Frank, although many might charge more. As you say, the risk is worth it. Not all of us have friends in Government House. We need someone to speak for us. I don't believe I've any friends at Government House either. They look on that charlatan Duchamp, the look on that charlatan Duchamp's face when he poked his, hell, his head into my cell could have curdled milk. I wish I could have given you some warning, but he arrived unannounced. The question is, said Horwood, why? But a question for another day. All right, then, as soon as I'm out, you know I'm good for, I'm good for it. Peter, the new copy boy, you've not met him, will be here to, to collect all this, in a, in a, all this while I'm in court. And it will be in tomorrow's paper? If I'm allowed to continue writing it, Hallwood said. Is it something that might land you back in here? Or ensure I'll never be back again? Can't tell you this time, Frank. Sorry. You can trust me, though. You told me about the break-in story, the one you fought the duel over, and I didn't breathe a word. I know, but this one, I can feel the heat coming off it. It will cut that bastard darling's administration from neck to crotch. The information in these pages, Frank, is far more dangerous than any musket ball. I would not want to put you at undue risk. Frank looked nervously around and peered out the door to make sure Crowdy wasn't listening. His deputy warden, a self-righteous man, was prone to eavesdropping. It would be a great risk to refer to the governor in such crass terms around Crowdy, even for an inveterate upsetter of apple carts like Hallward. Crowdy couldn't have heard, though, because Frank saw him walking now, walking down the long hall hallway towards the cell. Time is it? said Frank when Crowdy arrived. Already? According to the clock it is. You can't argue with a clock, said Crowdy. Frank shook his head. I'm getting as bad as the inmates. They constantly moan that time loses meaning here. But they say it drags, not gallops, and the sun wasn't yet in the corner of the yard when I came in. Uh, and then I'll just skip forward a bit because it's, I, I know it's getting a bit long. Uh, Crowdy stepped forward, holding out a hand from which manacles dangled. He's here to take Hallward to his court appearance. Surely not necessary in this case, said Frank. His Excellency was willing to change soldiers who fought for Britain, said Crowdy. Don't think he'd approve of leaving this one with his hands free. Crowdy placed a rough hand on Hallward's shoulder and shoved him forwards towards the door. You coming? Crowdy asked Frank. In a minute... This one's wily, so I'll search the cell for contraband. Frank waited for Crowdy and Horwood's footsteps to recede, withdrew papers from the desk drawer and stuffed them into his shirt. By the time Frank got outside, Crowdy was unlocking the prison cart. He was having a little trouble with the padlock, given that he still had one hand on Horwood's arm, although the prisoner was showing no signs of wishing to flee. You think he's going to grow wings? Frank asked Crowdy. Give it here. He had to admit that even with both hands, wrestling the padlock into submission was no easy task. The blasted thing was becoming increasingly disagreeable in protest at being rained on and infiltra infiltrated by the salty ocean breeze. If Frank had managed to open the door a few seconds earlier, it might not have happened. The crack of the shot, the shock of disturbed air, sent Frank stumbling backwards to the ground. His skull connected with a rock. He shook his head to clear the encroaching fog, rubbed, rubbed his eyes and put his hand down into a puddle. Odd, as it hadn't rained for a week. Odd, too, that the puddle was bright red 
and even odder that this liquid was flowing from the ruined forehead of Henry Hallwood, his hands, free or not, would have been useless in breaking this particular fall. Ooh, ooh, (laughs) tough stuff. Very nice. So I'm sorry if that went on a little bit long. No, it was nice. I, I can never estimate how long these things are The are Keneally Irish lilts in there somewhere. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that it's quite, it's quite tough writing. There seems to be a tendency with historical crime often to become a bit cosy for my liking. Yeah, I'm not uh, a really cosy... I'm not, I'm not super noir and gritty, but I'm not Father Brown either. No. So, yeah, I'm sort of somewhere <laughs> It's certainly not Father Brown. We're, we're <laughs> much tougher. It's, and the language is terrific, really salty and mm-hmm. hard... Gnarled language, I like that. Oh, you, you. You're instantly back there, so it's, and that's just the first few pages. Yeah, that's the first few. That's the that's the murder that um, mm. Montserrat and Marooney then sent to investigate. Yeah. And of course, um, we wouldn't have been doing our jobs if they had an easy time of that investigation. So naturally, they don't. Yeah. Um, torturing fictional characters is a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, we'll open it up to some questions. I think um, from the floor. Mm-hmm. Some questions about historical crime, the Cornelia writing style, less up the oh. back. Well, one of the things I like about um, when I'm writing my own stuff, I focus on. Um, the stories of women in history which haven't necessarily been told. And one of the things that I've always found fascinating about the female characters that I write about, real or imagined, and I've written both, um, is how, uh, despite all all the odds stacked against them, there were women who did extraordinary things in Australia's past. And I love looking at... I'm really fascinated about the psychology, the toughness that you need to have survived transportation to have um, made a life for yourself here, um, uh, to have left everything that you knew behind Mm. and still be psychologically viable enough to carve out Mm. a niche for yourself here. And these women obviously had the same advantages as men but were even more disadvantaged because of their gender um, uh, and obviously their social social standing and it was assumed all convict women were whores. So, for example, women like Mary Reby, who's on the $20 note, um, rose from a 14-year-old convict transported for, for, um, for stealing a horse to um, the Gina Reinhardt of uh, colonial Sydney. Um, she was one of the wealthiest people in the mm. colony by the time she died. So that would have been tough. It would have been doubly tough because she was a woman. People like Mary Bright, who I wrote about in Fled, um, uh, how she had to not only plan an escape, but how she had to very delicately operate the le- whatever levers were available to her and very had to navigate this world which was extremely hostile to her. So that's, those are the kind of stories I like. I like writing. I'm fascinated by how they managed to achieve what they achieved, even against such impossible odds. And you thread strong female characters through the Montserrat novels too? Mm, yes. In fact, Mrs Mulrooney is, the, as I mentioned, the brains behind the Operation oh, Montserrat's Housekeeper. Yes, so she, uh, she is not above flicking him with a, with a cleaning cloth when she feels he deserves it, <laughs> which is often. Mm. <laughs> Car- well, you mentioned the, the television series possibly. Any mm. ideas for casting these two extraordinary characters? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, we... Uh, we're in the very early stages of talking about that. I doubt I would get my dream Montserrat. My, if I could pick any actor in the world to play Montserrat, I'd pick Hugh Jackman. Um, uh, not Guy Pearce? No, uh, I, no Hugh, Hugh Jackman, I think. Yeah. But, you know, that's, I mean, that's complete fantasy. Yeah. So, um, uh, but Johnny Depp's are, available. Uh, he needs the work and the money (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but um yeah i mean we're we're we're, you know and this is this is by no means a certainty of um coming to fruition we're just in very preliminary discussions at the moment and these things often get optioned and then don't you know, my, my agent estimates maybe one in five that get optioned actually wind mm. up on the screen. It's a, it's a very, it's a real 
you know, a, a real roll of the dice. But, we, mm. you know, we keep chipping away. I just mm. keep knocking on doors until I annoy people into opening them. That's my strategy. <laughs> You're a Keneally. Yes. <laughs> More questions from the crowd there? Uh, yes, over there. Hmm. Um, well, we both, we, Dad and I both read a lot of, uh, particularly Dad, both read a lot of um, history. And it's quite incredible the stories that just sort of, uh, you, you know, you go down various little research rabbit holes, and at the bottom, sometimes at the bottom of these rabbit holes, you find treasure. Um, like, um, uh, you know, the story of the newspaper wars, which is at the centre of this. Mm. And the, this journalist who was murdered, um, there was no journalist murdered, but he is based on a man who actually existed called Edward Smith Hall, who um, was a thorn in the side of, of Governor Darling. So we were really interested in the fact that you've got this frontier town, essentially, as Sydney was, um, and you have this nascent free press um, and uh, you have a governor who is being completely whacked over the head every single day by this free press, and what does he do when he's the primary authority on this side of the globe and it takes nine months to get a letter back to England? Um, so, yeah, every time, I, every time I read a letter or look in an archive, there's another story that it gets turned up. The book I'm just about finished the first draft of at the moment... Um, I was researching a book I'm doing on Australian women in history, and I found this story of a young Polynesian, half Polynesian, half Jewish girl who was educated at Miss Flowers Ladies College. Yes, there was such a place <laughs> on the corner of Macquarie and Bent Streets. And then she was uh, taken out of school at the age of 14 to marry a 35-year-old abusive alcoholic who happened to be the Crown Prince of Tahiti. Um, mm. She... Uh, fled to Paris, where she hung around with Sa with Sarah Bernhardt and Somerset Maugham and Robert oh, Louis wow. Stevenson. Um, and then uh, she was convinced to come home when she became concerned that her drunken husband was looking at selling Tahiti for drinking money uh, to the <laughs> French. Um, and she did come mm. home. She was unable to uh, stop Tahiti uh, moving from a protectorate to a full colony, but she was essentially the last queen of Tahiti, this Sydney... Schoolgirl. Wow. So what that's story. that's yeah. the book I'm writing at the moment. And I just found this when I was when I was just, you know, reading about something else. There's a, another story I want to write, um, uh, about two convicts who um, uh, mutinied, seized a ship and sailed it to New Zealand and became the first two European women in New Zealand. So they're everywhere if you just read the if you read people's letters and journals and whatever if you just sort of run down rabbit holes on the mm. internet, there's always something that comes up. So um, uh, the next one that we want to uh, write is set in a... Um, uh, in the Montserrat series, is set in a penal station for educated convicts in Wellington near Dubbo. And we just happen to be there, mm. both of us, because um, we sometimes do road trips together. And we looked into this penal station and then we found out there were crystal caves nearby and I said to Dad, if we can't do something... With, with diprotodon skeletons in them. And I said to Dad, if we can't do something uh, with, with a, a penal station with crystal caves with skeletons in it nearby, we're not trying. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> Just following on from that question, what's your process journalistically to put all this together? You discover the, the, the journey of the story, as it were. Yeah. Uh, what do you do then? Just start making notes? Do you... That, I, I, I spent a couple of weeks really reading into it, but not the detailed stuff. I think it's really important to familiarise yourself with the picture frame, if you like, with the words, uh, with the world, what people wore, what they ate, what they did, what they would have sounded like, what their attitudes would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, because you then, when you're writing the story, you need to be able to slip through that wormhole very easily and at will. And that's how I prepare myself to do that. Mm. So I read around it. Uh, and then my poor little brain can't possibly um, hold everything it needs to hold at once. So I, I then start writing and I research the spe specific facets of the story that I'm writing about essentially as I'm writing it. I read somewhere that you, uh, when you're stuck, you ring Tom and you say, 
uh, what sort of shoes would this person be wearing? Yes, I've done, I've done that. I've done that in the past, and you know, very fortunate to have a walking filing cabinet as a, uh, a as a, as a father and as a as collaborator. A, yes. Exactly, uh, and as I said earlier, he's. Uh, I, I'd say, all right, your name's on the cover, so you have to answer my question. Yes. <laughs> there was a question there from that tall man. Oh, yes. Yeah, Pip Williams' book. Yeah. 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 And um, it's one of those books that, uh, as you read it, you kept wanting to reference, oh, is, is this actually happening? Yeah. Is the characters are real? The characters are very real, and yeah. And I was wondering, you were talking about historical fiction mm. Yeah, it's it's a tough one because you want to be authentic, but at the same time, you can never let yourself forget that your primary objective is to tell a story. Um, so uh, I have to constantly remind myself, okay, you're not writing a, a non-fiction history book; you're writing a novel, and so that and and sometimes it can be tempting to perhaps. Do, th do things which don't really service the story in the name of histor historical accuracy. Sometimes you can't allow yourself to do that because you, your, prior, your lodestar has to be the fact that you're writing a story which people are going to enjoy and find engaging and compelling and get something out of. Um, so my approach is always to, is generally to have a picture frame, as I was talking about before, which is historic, historically accurate. In the wreck, for example, the latest one, I've got the Peterloo Massacre and the Cato Street cons Conspiracy and the wreck of the Dunbar out uh, of Sydney. Uh, they provide the historically accurate picture frame in which my, through which my fictional character moves. Uh, so I think for me that's, that's the best sort of compromise between being authentic but also serving the needs of the story first that I've, that I've come across. And as I, as I mentioned, I always cop to it in an author's note at the end. If I've changed things for, um, for narrative reasons at the end of the book, I, I, I say I changed this because X, Y, Z. Yeah. Are there any other influences apart from your father? Uh, oh. in terms of historical crime or just crime writing oh, generally? Look, um, I, um, I tend to... I read Sherlock Holmes obsessively as a kid. Where I sit in crime is not at the cosy end of the, of the spectrum but not at the hard-bitten noir end of the spectrum with the mm. detective on his second divorce who drinks too much and mm. is estranged from his kids and always has a cigarette in his mouth and never irons his clothes. You know that guy? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we all know that guy. Yes. Uh, so I tend, to, I tend to love mysteries which are a bit more involved, a bit more sort of cerebral, which also reveal something about the... Um, uh, the world, the world in which they're set, or the world through which people move. So people like uh, Brother Cadfael, for example, um, uh, uh, you know, crime writers like that. Um, and it, it, some of the stuff that's come out of Scandinavia, no, notably um, the girl with the dragon tattoo, mm. um, Gone Girl. Um, uh, and on, on television, I love watching things like um, Silent Witness and Vera and that sort of. Mm. That sort of uh, thing. So that's where I where I fit in. But mm. you know, I do also love my Peter Chorus. Um, we've got extraordinary crime writers here in Australia. We've got people like um, Emma Viskic. If you haven't read any of her uh, crime novels, they're really fascinating. They're set in Melbourne, and her central character is a deaf detective. Um, so, and she is just extraordinary at writing this character's world. When you think about you know, at figuring out what is what information isn't accessible to him because he can't mm. hear, and how does he get his way around that to solve the solve mm. the murder? There's a really, really interesting mm. way to look at it as well. Uh, yes, this one. Yeah. I just wanted to ask mm. about um, historical fiction. Yeah. So if you didn't have Tom. Mm. To No, uh, not not out of lack of wanting to, but um, historians don't tend to 
unless you pay them a lot of money, they're not generally willing to review whole manuscripts. Mm -hmm. However, what they are willing to do is have a yarn with you if you buy them a coffee. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, quite often I will have a, you know, I will inveigle my way into a, a historian's office and talk about the world that I'm writing about beforehand and then um, once I'm sort of pretty much near the end, I'll go and buy them another coffee or another lunch or whatever and yeah. we'll talk about the things that have that have come up um, in, in the research. Uh, so um, uh, I'd love it if a historian would review my stuff. But then again, we come back to the tension between being historically accurate and telling yeah, a story. story yeah. Yes. So. A question a bit further back there. Yes. Ross, how are you? Mm. Uh, it's, um, it's, still, it's still pretty early, Ros. Um, uh, I, um, my working day is in a state of flux always because life, unfortunately, my life in particular seems very resistant to scheduling. Uh, but um, I, I've, I've got my corporate writing day job very early in the morning, the one that pays the mortgage, uh, and then once that's done, I was about to say after I take the kids to school, but as of this year, I have no kids at school. They're, no, they're no, both no. at uni now, so um, uh, I don't have to iron uniforms and make lunches But you've anymore. got scuba diving to instruct. You know. Well, yes, yeah. That, <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and that, that takes a bit of time and energy as well. Um, but I generally do my corporate corporate work and then once um, once that's done um, and I've managed to mentally shift gears I, I spend about six hours um, on the and more if I can on writing um, uh, and I find that anything more than about eight hours on top of my other work my brain starts to turn a little bit mm. a little bit jelly like but the thing about writing mm. is you have to treat it as a job because it is. So you do have to, even if because of unexpected things, you have to duck out somewhere or something disrupts your day, you still have to... I, I have my daily word count and if something disrupts me, then I just work later to get that word mm. count done. It's really important to have those goals, I think, so that you know what you're shooting for. Otherwise, you just or I would just shrug and go, oh, well, I've done enough for today. Mm. Whereas if you've got your word count or when you're editing your page count, you're like, actually, no, you haven't done enough for today. Mm. You haven't done what you said you would. So, mm. And that's the only way to do it, to keep chipping away, no matter whether you feel like it or not, and treat it as a job. Yes, sir? Just following on from that, mm. Um, it depends. Um, Fled took me a little more than a year. Um, our first one in the Monstrat series, The Soldier's Curse, took about six months. Um, I, I tend to average 11 months, 12 months around there. Um, I think uh, anything <laughs> less than that is probably... You're probably rushing it not doing the mm. best job you can. But that's just me. And, I mean... Um, uh, the speed with which people write, um, uh, it, it varies like everything else. But what I find is once I've got the... What takes more time is the second draft. Because getting the first draft on, on paper and going splat is fine, but then you, your characters are developing as you write, and then you, you then need to go back and make sure that everything's consistent, Ooh. make sure that they're still the same people who you started to write because they change on you without asking your permission. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just make sure that what you wanted to come out is still coming out and hasn't been muddied by all of the, all of the changes. And that is when I curse myself because I come across, like, little highlighted bits in brackets saying, make sure you check earlier that this is consistent. Open brackets. Mm. Check the motivation here, close brackets. And that's when I curse past Meg, who makes a lot of work for future Meg. <laughs> <laughs> I've chatted a few times over the years with um, Michael Connolly, the, uh, the writer of the Rebus books, not Rebus books, um, uh, oh, what is his name? Bosch books, thank you very much. Um, and he says the problem for him is because he's now, of course, internationally famous, mm. that he has editors from all, Patrick will appreciate this, editors from all over the world wanting different timelines. Yes. And he has to write, you know, different endings for different countries. And, uh, oh, right. That creates all sorts of problems. Yes. But the great Elmore yes. Leonard once said uh, that uh, he realised that... It, uh, he could write a page a day 
and there are about 360 odd days in a year, so then you stop a book. Yeah, well, that's it's pretty, true. Pretty easy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How many books did Elmore Leonard write? About 400? Oh, I, 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 God knows. You could, you, your bookshelf would collapse if you yes, had Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I just saw a hand raised at the back. No, someone was scratching their nose. Oh, here, I have it here. Mm. How the structure has come to not the end, it started off you had something yeah. that died. Yes. Mm. You know, in the formulae crime novels, there's a lot of variants a lot. Yes. Do you go back and change that? Or mm. do you have, have you Yeah, I a lot of a lot of people do. Um uh I sort of my own personal way of doing it is I've I've got in the back of my mind that we've got to have some false flags, we've got to have some mm. little rabbit holes to go down, um, uh, and that they have to be peppered in. But I tend to let the characters drive them. So as the characters are developing, it becomes obvious that someone's going to be the obvious suspect who ends up not being guilty. Mm. Someone else is going to be someone a little dodgy who might have information mm. on someone else a little dodgy, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, one of the big challenges, of course, with writing historical fiction is that you don't have DNA, you don't have fingerprints, no, you don't have... Uh, so you have, to, you have to put a lot more thought into how you can plausibly um, say beyond doubt that this person or that person is the killer. So that's, that's one of the challenges with it as well. It's thing about red herrings too. Ian Rankin, the great Scottish writer, mm -hmm. once said that uh, he could put a character in a taxi, his, his detective character, into a taxi with a woman in a yellow raincoat mm. and just leave it there, never explain it. Because in three books' time, he could come back and write a book about, about a woman, woman in, in a yellow, yellow raincoat. raincoat. Yep. <laughs> well, I thought that was rather clever. I think uh, so Yes, too. that's there. Thank you. Mm. Um, in the last couple of years, there's been quite a lot of books, both fiction and non-fiction, coming out um, around that same period, but Aboriginal voice. Aboriginal yeah. voice. And I'm wondering whether you approach that, whether you give voice to Aboriginal women of that particular period of time in their history, mm. and how you incorporate that, or do you incorporate that into your life? That's, a, mm. that, that's something I struggled with a lot when I was writing Fled because I was keenly aware that in writing about the first fleet, I was writing about the day everything changed for the worse and has never changed back for, um, for First Australians. And I also, you know, very conscious of wanting to avoid cultural appropriation. Yeah. Um, uh, but at the same time, if you're writing about the first fleet, you can't not write about Indigenous people because to do that would be to perpetuate the whole terra mm. nullius. Um, oh. myth. Um, I ended up having a character uh, based on Barangaroo who um, teaches uh, my convict character about the landscape uh, and in, in Fled and about, um, about language, about country as much as she can. They don't speak the same language, but she teaches her. Eora women, were, were their job was fishing, one of their their primary functions in Eora society was to fish. So she teaches her about fishing, about the waters and that sort of thing. Um, uh, but I would hesitate to write anything from the perspective of um, a First Nations person. I don't think that's my story to tell. Mm. But at the same time, and there are books in which I don't mention, set in colonial Australia, which I don't mention Indigenous people a lot. I let myself be guided by the history at the time. So, for example, when this was set and when um, uh, my book The Wreck was set, which was around the same time, um, the British had been so ruthlessly efficient at uh, clearing Sydney of its Indigenous population. They were all either institutionalised or dead. Uh, there were still, um, at this stage, some living um, uh, to the south of Botany Bay, but they were not as a whole seen in Sydney. Um, uh, they were either for their own good in institutions or they had been murdered. Uh, so when there isn't an actual record of many Indigenous people having been in Sydney at the time, I don't fabricate them, but I do make sure I note in the story that the reason they're not here is because of the brutal efficiency of the British in clearing them. 
over here. I've met you said you're a leveler, mm. collaborating with Tom. Yes. When you're writing solo again, how has that changed your writing? Oh, good question. Um, I think one of the main things I'm, I'm aware of, and one of the things that um, uh, I think is, si since then I've mentored a few, uh, a few other writers, and the one thing I've noticed in most manuscripts by relatively new writers is that the central characters tend to be a little too passive. And, you know, one of the things that Dad sort of drummed into me, which I think has really, really helped me, is... Um, and, and, and a lesson I'm still trying to learn as well is agency. Everyone has to earn their place on the page. Every character has to have, has to act on the plot rather than having the plot act on them. Every character has to have an internal engine to drive them forward. And I think that that's something that's too easy to overlook, I think, sometimes. And especially timid creatures like me tend to write characters which are too passive. So I have to actually be conscious of of beefing them up. Um, the other thing he says is he reckons I anthropomorphise things too much. Uh, but uh, So I have to watch out for that as well. Um, uh, but uh, just, you know, having a few things like that highlighted by him, like the importance of giving characters agency, um, mm. the importance of internal consistency, that's really helped me go from, uh, you know, writing with him to writing solo. Yeah. Final question, maybe. No? Well, we shall adjourn then for a book selling and a book signing. Out the Thank back. You. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you.